fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the House of Mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino, John Copenhaver, and Al Warren. Good on FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 1050 AM Palm Springs. Welcome back to the House of Mystery. I'm Al Warren. Mr. Dave Martino is back. The Karate I'm Kid. Back. Yeah. <laughs> back for the attack. Back for the attack. Yeah, it never ends, does it? <laughs> no. Never ends. Heavy duty, I'll tell you. Work yeah. is, is just a whip and a chain. You know, that's right. Yeah. We were, yeah. <laughs> Can't wait till uh, I get a holiday. I know. know. Well, that's uh, coming up. Oh, well, when I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Well, anyway, well, we'll get back into it today. And of course, we've got a writer today and his uh, book is called Pike Boys. And uh, the author is with us. So Danny Cherry Jr., thank you for coming on the show. No problem at all. I'm happy to be on. So, so Danny, um, let's let's start out. What made you decide to write a book? Like, how did you get into writing a book like this? I'll try to keep my origin story very brief. Uh, but um, I've loved writing ever since I was a kid. From the first time my parents took me to a freaking library, I was hooked. But as far as you know, particular to this book, you know, to jump a decade or so uh, later. Uh, I just always loved those shows like Sopranos, uh, Bulwark Empire, Sons of Anarchy. And uh, I just wanted to see if I could write something of that caliber, or at least attempt to, which has been also noticed that at least I've never seen a book that was a crime book set in the 1920s and New Orleans. Like Dennis Lehane has his uh, Coughlin series, but I wanted to have my own, you know, version of that except in New Orleans. So that's how uh, I ended up writing this book. Yeah, but did some, some, something give you the courage? You know, because when you write something nowadays, and nowadays everybody's so judgmental and they all have access to you. You can put something out and people could be really mean, right? Mm-hmm. They can say all sorts of stuff. And you kind of have to have a little bit of nerve to actually write and then put it out there. And uh, can, you know what I mean? Was there something that kind of gave you that courage? <laughs> Honestly, uh, when I started this book, I was in a dorm room and 20 years old, so I just had to unearn the confidence of a young man. And at the time, I just didn't think about all that stuff. I was just writing for myself. I was just being, you know, like how I was when I was a kid. When I was a kid, I was writing for myself. I'd write uh, these little cartoons or comic books, better yet, and just put that stuff in a, in, a, uh, in a dresser drawer. Nobody else read it, well, except my parents. So at the time, I wasn't worried about that. No, when I got older, I started to think, you know, a little bit, to be honest with you, like four or so years later, I thought to myself, oh, crap, this is going to be out there for the world to see. Like, what if it sucks? What if people pan it? Or I get, I don't know, I hate this term, but well, somebody tries to, quote, unquote, cancel me or whatever. That came later, though. But after a while, I was just like, if this is what I want to do in my life, I have to be okay with whatever happens. Absolutely. You just got to do it. What, why, um, you mentioned New Orleans. Why did you pick New Orleans for the setting? Oh, well, because I was born in New Orleans, specifically New Orleans East, uh, to be very specific if there's any New Orleans listeners. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love this city. Like, even if I didn't live here, well, I'm obviously biased, but even if I didn't live here, I'd still want to write about it. Like, just such a rich, untapped history for the crime, you know, noir genre, in my opinion. So I wanted to try to add to that uh, mythology of New Orleans, I guess you can say. Oh, certainly, because uh, if, if if I was going to watch a black-and-white noir film new orleans fits yeah <laughs> you know what i mean like it's it's got that and 1920s so why why the 1920s area what was it uh, about that that time frame that's pretty much the era that built the america that we know nowadays in my opinion as far as uh the culture of kind of distrust of government uh that's whenever organized crime as we know it nowadays became a thing And there was just all these unintended consequences of the Ballstad Act. So pretty much it was the wild, wild west. 
So that means, you know, it was, you know, right for me to go and build the world I wanted. And like, you know, because there was also just so much like there was so much that intersected politically with prohibition. There was the early days of the religious right movement. There was the women's rights movement and all these other things. So I knew when I was going to start this series, I can go so many directions, like like so many. So that's part of the reason why I chose that era. How much research does it take to do something like that to get back in the 20s uh, to make sure you get it right? A lot. A lot of my time was spent in the school library researching, more so than my own homework. Kind of ridiculous. But uh, I watched a bunch of documentaries on Prohibition. Uh, and as far as to get the lingo down, I, I kind of just watched, like, some TV shows based in that era and I also read some, like, really old articles and stuff like that. And uh, I also found – oh, I should really shout this book out. I found this uh, academic book by uh, Dr. Louis Viant. Oh, crap, I can't say his last name. But it's called, anyway, it's called um, Unorganized Crime, New Orleans in the 1920s. And that was pretty much like a, a textbook of all things organized or un unorganized crimes in the 1920s New Orleans. Like some of my characters are based on, loosely based on, the people he introduced in his book. And a lot of the political climate in this book is based on the actual political climate of the era. Like in this book, there's a, an election in 1920. And in real life, there was an election in 1920. Now, obviously, because it's fiction and it's a thriller and whatnot, I, you know, there are some parts I played up. But what I wrote isn't far off at all from what would have happened back then as far as the corruption in New Orleans. Right, right, right. Things. I'm, I'm glad it's all over now and, and they've solved all those problems. <laughs> and there's no more corrupt, corruption or <laughs> distrust of, 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 you know, politicians or police. Or I'm glad everything's good now. <laughs> Yeah, we got to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank God. Well, that's so. Jesse Pike is is kind of your main character, right? Yes. And, and so, how did you develop Jesse Pike? Where did he come from? Was it kind of a combination of people you know? Was it just something out of the blue? How? What's that process? So, my inspiration for him, as well as his tra his trajectory, he's going to take throughout the series, is a mix of Jax Teller from uh, Sons of Anarchy. And as far as his arc, I'm trying to go with the Walter White from Breaking Bad type arc because um, I hope I didn't spoil anything, whatever. But anyway, uh, no, no. <laughs> so uh, like in this first book, he's rather tame. He's trying to do the best he can in a corrupt society. Uh, and then as things go on, I want him to break bad, so to speak. So that's the inspiration for his character and his character arc. How do you experience your character like Jesse Pike? Is this something that you do? You, do you hear him as a voice? Do you see him like a movie when you write or interact? Do you consider him like a friend or kind of what? What is your experience with Jesse when you're creating the dialogue? Oof. Um, I believe. You tell the truth. It doesn't. If you're nuts, that's fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I'm trying to think. So I believe. Okay. So the voice I hear in my head whenever. Uh, I was writing at the time I was writing I and mean, I was watching a lot of uh, Boardwalk Empire. So as far as his, my, you know, internally his speech pattern and stuff, I based off of the character Jimmy Darmody. Yeah. So that was kind of like my template. And then I went back in and I kind of tried to put a, I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to show this in text and prose, but I tried to put a New Orleans spin on it, at least in my head. So that's typically what I do when I write. I start with a template. And then as I go, I try to break it up and make it into more of my style, if that makes sense. Well, does Jesse ever surprise you when you're writing him? Does he kind of take on a life of his own and, uh, you know, kind of take the, the plot and your structure that you've created off the rails? <laughs> yes, there was a few parts where uh, I wanted to go one direction and then it went another. I'll put it that way. And um, so, yeah, he, a lot of my characters take on a life of their own whenever I'm writing. First thing I start with before I even start with any plot or anything is I want to get to know them. I make a character Bible, I guess you can call it. I want to know what they would do in their downtime. You know, what's their relation to the other characters? I, like I, I create a grid and then I just kind of draw a line from one character to the other. And I ask myself, how would they get along? And that's how I built this personality. You know, somebody that's cunning, somebody that has an aptitude for the criminal life, but hates that about himself. And, like, that's what drives a lot of him throughout this book, even though it might be subtle, uh, is he has a severe self-loathing for himself. And 
that kind of is the foundational part of his character. And everything in that book is him trying to push back against the reasons why he loads himself. So I tried to stay true to that aspect of his personality. Now, this is, yeah, this is book one. Mm-hmm. Do you kind of have like an idea of where you're going to go with this? Can you have, do you have kind of like a beginning and an ending in your, in your mind and you're going to work your way there through the books? Oh, yeah. Like I pretty much already have book two figured out. It's, it's just a matter of, uh, putting the words on the page. Um, the third book, I have the ending. I know where the series overall is going to go. Now it's the filling in the rest of it that I'm going to, you know, have to do. But to answer your question, yes, I, I know where I want this to go. I definitely have an ending in mind that I would like to think will be very poetic. I'll put it that way. Oh, there you go. Secrets. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so what's your favorite part about writing this book? I like writing um, crappy people. I almost cursed my bad. Uh, I like writing people who are uh, <laughs> complex. I like writing people who are antiheroes. For all intents and purposes, based by any standard of any quote-unquote moral person, the Pike brothers are not good people. Not at all. And I like the challenge of making the readers feel for them. That's That was always my favorite part of crime sh- all the crime shows I watched. Is that uh, Jax Teller, Nucky Thompson, uh, the the main characters from Peaky Blinders, etc. They they are not good people. They hurt a lot of people. And but however, you kind of don't realize, oh crap! I actually care about them as human beings. Meanwhile, they're dehumanizing others. And it like it, to me to answer your question because I could talk about this all day. It's much more fun to write about the bad guy than the good guy. Well, why do you think that is? Like, what what is it about? writing a person and how do you get into that headspace because i you could easily just kind of go well he does this he does that he shoots this person or stuff like that but to make it to make a character real and make people believe and feel that character is there some sort of way you go about doing that to to make it so why would i care about jesse pike so in the book the pike brothers they have uh, their inciting incident is they grew up in an abusive household, like a violently abusive household. And uh, and they were around a drug addiction, like their mom was an addict. Um, their dad was a drunk. Like they have like a reasoning for why the way they are. And a lot of this book is honestly just psychologically analyzing them. So like while, you know, the Pike brothers are committing crimes and actively causing great harm, there is a psychological reason for it. And as to why it's much more fun to write about the bad guy is because when you live by modern standards or even standards of that day, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of intriguing to play with the idea of being outside the law. That's why some of the most popular characters in television and even movies are antiheroes because I feel like there's just, I feel like the, every reader, especially readers of thrillers just would like to be in the head of a badass for a little bit. I guess is what I'm getting at. There's just something enticing about it. And I just love writing about those types of people. Not sure if that makes sense, but yeah, no, that's a, yeah. You know, Dave. Dave's been running from the law for ten years. And <laughs> just don't tell anybody. And he's great to have on, you know, all the time because he's in a different location each time and a different hideout. And yeah, it's really exactly. It's, it's a lot of fun. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I kind of like that. Yeah. Um, violence. Are you thinking about violence when you write it? Do you do you emphasize it? Does it come across, or do you kind of soften it or like are you conscious because today nowadays you know there's you can it can be a good thing or a bad thing and you can you know how are you do you think about violence at all yeah this this book is very violent i'll be honest with you there's one scene in particular i'll just call it the torture scene that um every pretty pretty much most readers who've given me feedback have said that was a bit much but however i like to be gritty and realistic like i don't believe in coddling readers you know, everybody, you know, has their own way of or reason for doing things. But I am being accurate to what would have been going on back then, at least in my opinion, based on my own research. And during that era, people were violent. It was a violent time. We were damn near uh, um, primitive, except we had pants on, you know. Yeah, well, I'm I'm glad that we don't do that anymore. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, how, how do you choreograph, um, you know, the, these action scenes, you know, the violence and all that stuff? Do, do, do you um, do you act it out? Do you uh, sit down and have maybe kind of a uh, 
a story within a story for that, for, for the for the action scene itself. Uh, how, how do you approach people, that? What do you think? He goes, oh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> of course. Uh, so if there was ever any time where any camera in my house got tapped, you would see me walking around like a psychopath and like actually acting out. <laughs> like I, I, I talk to myself a lot. Uh, also, that goes back to the dialogue, and also uh, as far as actual ac- action sequences. I sometimes act them out, especially if they're more, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Intricate. Like if it's like very fast paced, like there's a scene where one of the characters in the book is pretty much getting jumped by one, two, three, three, yeah, three or four guys. And after a while, if you're just writing that, it's kind of hard to keep track of who's where. So I kind of like, right, had to act it out. It's, it's, it's kind of crazy, you know, but yeah, I'm, if you ever tap my camera in my house, uh, for, you know, that we use to watch my dog, uh, you'll see a grown man just moving around fighting no one. Yeah. We've, we've been running that online and charging yeah. nine bucks. <laughs> and we're doing okay. It got about 3,000 yeah. subscribers already. So keep it up. You know. I just, I just want my cut. <laughs> so, so, yeah. So, so if I get this right, you hear, you're, you're sitting in your house hearing voices and you're acting out all these things and talking to yourself. Yeah. So. What's what's abnormal? Everything's good. Everything's good. Oh, good. Yeah. Do they give you a driver's license, or do they take that away? No, not yet. They haven't. They haven't uh, taken that away from me yet. <laughs> they haven't discovered the truth. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, when you write a story like this, are you thinking about your your reader? Are you thinking about what the reader would would do or say or think as you write now? Or are you or are you still kind of not not at that level? You're not doing that. No, I don't, I don't really, I don't care anymore, to be honest with you. I, I try to, <laughs> I have like my own moral code, because I also do freelance journalism too. I have my own code that I stick to. I don't want to, uh, well, you can't help who you offend. I'm going to put that out there, but I never want to intentionally be malicious, whether it's fiction or nonfiction. So like this book is violent, but however, I, I, it's not gratuitous. I try not to get too crazy. Like there is mention of abuse of women in this book, and I understand that some of the people that might read this book will have uh may have experienced that. So I don't, I try not to do more than what I have to. If that makes sense, I try not to uh trigger anyone. So I guess yeah, I guess I do kind of think of my reader in that regard. But other than that, I kind of just I write for myself. Yeah, well that's good. Yeah, I mean I I I think that's good. I. uh I could care less. I, I I get lots of hate mail, so don't have yeah, no big deal. Uh, subtext, then, is there a meaning? Is there some sort of purpose underneath the action, the story, and all the stuff going on in there? And even if it happened organically, maybe as you wrote it, is there some sort of thing that you want a reader to take away besides the the story itself, the action? Oh yeah, genre for me is just a vehicle to tell the story, the real story I want to tell, which which typically is a moral question for me. Like I tend to, I don't know, sit here and have some Socratic thinking about certain situations, and I then sometimes get to writing and think to myself, what's the best format or genre I should say to tell this in? The Pike Boys, the entire message of this first book is, can people truly change? Or is who we are ingrained in us from birth? Is it caused by the environment we're in? You know what I mean? And that's the subtext of much of all my work is, is who are these characters? What do they stand on? What are their morals? And how does the society they live in force them to go against their morals? So that's, that's, uh, yeah, that, that kind of plays into my philosophy for life too. Cause I do think that the society you're born in informs who you are as a person. So it's usually, my stories are usually a subtle critique of, of society too. I just try not to beat the reader over the head with it. You know, so I like, you know, I try to undercut it with some action, some violence, some, some stuff that's kind of fun because I don't want to want to navel gaze too much because I might as well just write a freaking philosophy book if that's what I want to get, want to do. Um, so, you know, the, the accessory characters, the people that are around your main characters and stuff, um, where do they come from? Are they people you know? Like, have you killed off someone you know and don't like? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't done that yet. I haven't met someone that's pissed me off that much yet. But uh, it's the, I'm still young. I'm sure by the by the time I'm more experienced, I'll find <laughs> at least one person I hate that much. Well, you know, I, I I know writers that have like you know they get cut off in traffic and they take that character or some some rude lady in the lineup says something to them and they take that persona that character 
and write them in the book and, you know, off them. Oh, yeah. I think there's like a pretty known story. Oh, I'm going to butcher this. I'm bad at retelling stories. She's actually my wife. But uh, I'm pretty sure Stephen King killed off a famous director he hated in uh, The Shining or something like that. <laughs> Stanley Kubrick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that's yeah. it. I think that's the guy. Yeah. yeah so <laughs> I get it, man. I get it. I mean, I'm sure that was cathartic for him. You know, you can't get arrested for killing off a fake person. <laughs> But, um, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> not yet, anyway. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, as far as how I build my, uh, additional characters, I use them as a, as a stealth way to world build. So, like, I have a character in this book that allowed me to, which is Rose. Her name's Rose. That was my way of exploring the women's rights movement, even though it was very light, you know, if you do admit it. But, uh, or there's another character, uh, Twitch who is pretty much the enforcer for the Pike brothers. He's their childhood best friend. And he's also the only one that has a family in this book. So through him, I got to build a world of, uh, you know, what does it look like for the home life for a gangster? So every character starts as just the personification of another part of the world. I want the reader to experience. So that's my little cheat for how I do that. How do you write the female character? What, what do you do to get into the head of that? Put on a dress like what no what you, <laughs> like no but uh, you know what i'm saying because you said you know you like to talk it out and work it through and do actions and stuff like that so when you're doing an, an important female character one that's kind of significant enough that is in there and tells part of the story what how do you set yourself up for that so whenever i'm writing a character that's not from my lived experience i try to tread lightly i don't try to do more than what's outside of my knowledge. So as far as with Rose, um, I just kind of wrote her like I did all the other characters. Like, obviously, I had to bring up the fact she was a woman in the 1920s, which was a very oppressive time for women. So I couldn't skirt over that. But outside of that, I didn't I, I didn't really overemphasize the fact that she was female, if, you know, if that makes sense. Uh, and then also at that time, I kind of knew because, like, I wrote this, I finished this book, what, uh, six years ago. And in my mid twenties, I didn't have that much. I didn't have the level of nuance I have now. So I knew I didn't have the capability to do more than just treat her like every other character I wrote outside the fact that acknowledging that as a woman in the 1920s, things would have been real crappy for her. So I tried it lightly. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think, I think it's just showing respect for the character and what they go through mm. uh, and not and not necessarily judgment you know mm. that's how i kind of find it you know just to, um because we have human elements to all of us yeah to, to kind of go well how would you feel if and put yourself in that place and you have to really put yourself there i think when it comes across you know makes it real um inspiration for you what 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 drives you what gives you inspiration and it doesn't have to be other writers of course mm. Besides Dave and I and our books that are a huge inspiration for you, but <laughs> yeah, of course. Other than, other than that, <laughs> um, what, where, where do you draw your inspiration from? I'm a pretty weird guy. I I I I, I try to make a story out of anything. There was a comedian at home who, in a stand-up set years ago that I watched, he said that he puts his punchlines with no you know uh, hook yet or whatever, with no, no setup yet in a bowl and he'll just spin his hand around up in the bowl and then pick out a punchline and go from there. I do something similar, except I'll just look at an object and I'll think to myself, what type of story could I make out of this? Or, um, whenever I get like a good sentence in my head that I like, I'll say, I'll, I'll use it as a prompt of sort. Or honestly, like if I'm watching like a, I'm a history buff. If I'm watching something from a documentary or whatever, I'll ask myself, how can I make this into a story? So to answer your question, there's an there's ideas around us every freaking where. And sometimes I just challenge myself to come up with an idea. They're not all winners. They are not. Some of it's down downright some of the worst stuff you've ever read in your life. Like if I don't know, if I ever become famous and some archivist ever gets my hard drive, they're gonna find some of the most embarrassing right like ideas I've ever, you know, they've ever seen in their life. But, you know, I feel like most of writing is just getting wrong fast. Because out of like a hundred kind of, you know, meh ideas, at least one good idea is going to come out of it. So I just try to, you know, pump up my quantity of ideas so that I can get to the good ones, you know, 
quicker, or as Bill Hader once said, uh, he tries to be wrong fast. So. Yeah. <laughs> and now, now, comedy is important to you. Do you put any sort of humor throughout the book as well, even though it's crime? I try to pick my spots. It's it's hard. Like I would like to think I'm a funny guy in my you know in my in my real life uh, with my friends and when I'm just BSing around bars and whatnot. But it's hard for me to put that into my writing sometimes because I write about a lot of dark stuff, <laughs> like a lot of violent stuff, no matter the genre or even if it's nonfiction. So I, to answer your question, I try to. It's just it's not easy. <laughs> like I could think right. I can think of the one bit, bit of levity they have in this book. And um and it's it I, I still don't think it's that funny, but I try. Is to answer the question. It's it's not easy though. It's No, no, you gotta gotta have the right timing. Yeah. Right? But I think it's important. I think I think it's realistic. I, it's hard to to deal with some violent and hard situations and sometimes you know the 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 humor is a way of kind of dealing with it yeah like i'm trying to like learn how to do satire better or comedy better that's something i've been um trying to work on and it's a working process though the hardest part is that most of comedy is timing and how you say things too you kind of lose that when you're writing prose especially like with my writing style i'm very descriptive and like by the time I have a setup with something, after I've been getting done describing the emotional turmoil somebody's feeling, the, the the timing's all off and the joke doesn't land. So I'm still trying to figure that out though. Um, so I've been experimenting with some political satire, which is more my my jam anyway, because I'm not a big uh, punchline setup guy. Even though I do structure my books that way and my short stories, but anyway. Yeah, and there's certainly a lot of. Uh, comedy and politics lately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's 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 ridiculous, man. It's uh, yeah, it's the onion is going to be out of a job pretty soon if things keep getting freaking crazy <laughs> like it has been. <laughs> well, when you're writing all this dark stuff, do you, do you need to, do you find that you need to take a break, um, move away from it, do something else, decompress, um, or does it not bother you? Oh no, it definitely gets to me. Uh, more so, fiction, not so much. I, uh, I, I tend to, I tend, like, with my journalistic writing, that, that, that bums me out. I'll be honest with you. So I typically take breaks. Like, uh, I'm not a very, uh, fast writer when it comes to my nonfiction stuff, simply because the content can be pretty jarring. Like right now, I'm writing about a conspiracy to dismantle public education. And that has required me to read a manifesto from a pretty, well, he's dead now, from this guy who's pretty unhinged, though. And as I'm watching his actual action plans play out in real life, I, it's not making me feel good. So I've had to, <laughs> like, an hour at a time. So, like, I worked on it for an hour today, and I'm probably not going to touch it again until later tonight because it's, it's pretty heavy. And once I'm done with this, I'll focus on, fiction for another month or two until I feel like I need to make my opinions on stuff known again. And then I'll write another nonfiction piece. Well, you know, I think, I think the, uh, you can take some sort of solid, I mean, in, in a way, these things that are happening, like with the, you know, your, your education system and stuff, it, it's, it, and if you write, you know, you wrote back in the twenties, you, you could probably see that this, um, this sort of, attack on on human rights and stuff it's always been there and i don't think it goes away i think it just comes in waves and i think it's times when you see it it's so sometimes you got to think that uh eventually it just keeps on moving forward and 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 not let it get you down you know yeah like uh um one thing that's being a not just a historical fiction writer but um um just a history buff in general, just for fun, is progress comes in waves. Like, there's always going to be progress, then there's going to be backlash. There's going to be progress, then backlash. That's always how it happens. And, right, you know, in a lot of regards lately, we've been backsliding. And you're right, this has always been a part of American culture, specifically. Like, I can paint a straight line from the early days of the Cold War to what we're seeing now, you know, with the knowledge I have about the 20th century. 
But I also know that things, they, they're going to get better. In some regards, they're already getting better. Like with the book banning stuff, you know, like y'all are in the publishing business. So like, I know that I would like to think that y'all are against book banning, but like their book banners are losing now. Like it's starting to lose steam. So we're already starting to see a lot of this, uh, backslide wear off already, you know? So. Yeah. And I've been doing a lot of stuff. I'm writing stuff, stuff for the 60 in the sixties and, and you know, the, the people then too probably thought it was the end of the world, mm. right? You had rock and roll and, and, uh, it, it, you just think of all the stuff, the assassinations of presidents and the Vietnam and you had all these things going on and they, they must have thought, you know, communism, it was crazy and you make it through. You know what I mean? The, the good comes through and it does eventually win. Sad thing is that we have to keep going through these battles, um, and people get hurt. And at the end of the day, that's the sad thing, you know, but it's what, it's what's happening. So. Oh yeah. It's, I mean, yeah, that's, that's also why like a lot of my fiction tends to trim more on the heavier side because real life's heavy and like, yeah. And I would like to think by writing, you know, the darkest truths through works of fiction, that kind of, I don't know, maybe I'm putting too much self-importance in my work, but I would like to think that this helps people. Well, one provides some escapism, but also, uh, kind of put in a, I'm trying to see how to put this, not only provide escapism, but sometimes for me, at least it's easier to consume the dark realities whenever it's, there's some removal from it, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Oh, totally. Totally. And I understand totally why you would write it realistic and, and more hard boiled than, than soften it because it, it gets the point across better. It, it's more relatable to me anyway. I think it's better to do that. Yeah. And, uh, with this second book, something I plan on doing at the time, um, that I didn't have at the time I worked, wrote the first book, excuse me, is I'm much more politically engaged now. I'm much more aware of how things work. So I do want to get more into the, the politics of prohibition in the second book and everything that's around it, that like the fascism movements that came afterwards and all that other stuff. And, um, so yeah, I mean, don't, don't get me wrong. The thriller element's still going to be there because again, yeah. if I want to write a history book, I might as well just write a nonfiction history book, but that's something I'm very excited about digging into, um, the politics of it and also the racial politics and all that other stuff, you know, cause yeah. So that's something I'm very excited about with the second book. Well, I'm a good Canadian boy, so we were selling the liquor to Americans. Oh yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure my forebearers are pretty thankful to y'all for that. So, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. We're all about as much freedom as possible. You know, come on. Um, okay, so you seem to be very involved. Mm -hmm. You're very. It's very important to you the stories. You're very much a part of it and the characters, and you're going through it, and you're acting out, you're really kind of living through the book. So when you finish a book like this, and you're writing the second book now, um, how do you think that whole experience is changing you? Uh, so writing for me has always been compulsive. Like, uh, even as a kid, it was more like, it's probably a very strong word, but I can't think of it, a better one. It was like an addiction. Whenever I got an idea, if I didn't get it out, like it would just, it would just, be stuck in my head and drive me crazy. So whenever I'm done with a book, I'm usually, or a short story even, or a nonfiction piece, I'm done with that idea. It's no longer plaguing me. It's for the rest of the world to deal with. Like, uh, that's pretty much what drives every idea I have is compulsion. If I, especially if I think it's important for people to know if it's nonfiction or it's important story, story to tell in, in, uh, fiction. Once it's out, I'm done with it and I can sleep easier at night. The bodies are buried. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Once it's out in the world, it's for the public to, you know, do what they will with. Okay, so you're working on the second book now and stuff, and uh, everything's good. So now, are you doing um, social media? Do you have a website? Do you have a place? Do you like to interact with people or readers, or do you, do you not do that? Oh, yeah. D dude, I, I love interacting on social media. It's a problem. I would probably be way more prolific if social media were to go up in flames. Uh, I'm as the kids say too online. Like I am like they got memes came out five minutes ago. I probably already know about even though we're talking right now. No, I'm joking obviously, but, uh, yeah, I'm on Twitter, TikTok. I had to take a break from because I was getting addicted to that. They make it real easy. Like that endless scroll thing. Oh man. Next thing you know, you're all down a rabbit hole 
and you've been on TikTok for 45 minutes and you're late for work. Um, okay. So, and do you have a website? So Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, and Blue Sky. I am the Cherry Rider, you know, for the listeners that want to engage with me. That's D E E, Cherry like the fruit and then Rider like what I do. And, uh, I do have a website, um, slash blog, bigeasypress.com. And that's for my random ramblings whenever I just have a blog or whatever I want to post about that I don't feel like pitching, but it's primarily going to be for my published work that I publish myself or any collaborations I have in the future. Cause I do plan on one day, you know, like, it, like one day I would like to publish other people's work, but for now it's just for me. Well, fantastic. Of course, we'll put all that up along with your book on our websites and everything like that. And be fantastic. You know, wish you well. Um, now the book is called the Pike boys. Yes. And uh, Danny, Danny Cherry Jr. is the writer and he's been our guest. So thanks for coming on the show. No problem at all. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Danny. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This is the introduction of something with media. I'll be back.